Well, hello, Walden Community Church. My name is David, and we are continuing our study in the book of Romans, but we're going to start with a verse from Acts chapter 18, which says, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. So at its earliest, the Christian church was Jewish, right? And it was more a sect of Judaism than it was its own religion. And because the first Christians were persecuted, they became the first missionaries and they traveled to places where they would live, right? And then they brought the gospel with them. One of the cities that the Jewish people gathered was Rome. Rome was a cosmopolitan city. It was normal for people to worship different gods. But the idea of worshiping only one god was a little strange back then. And so eventually, Christians started to become persecuted in Rome as well. One historian said within 20 years of the crucifixion of Jesus, there appeared to have been enough Christians in Rome to create a disturbance worthy of the emperor's attention. And so as a result, the emperor Claudius banished the Jews from Rome. One Roman historian said, since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Christ, Claudius expelled them from Rome. This banishment lasted five years and was lifted when Claudius died in 54. That means that Without church buildings, or designated teachers, or a written Bible, Roman Gentiles, they knew very little about the Old Testament and how that fit in with the gospel of Jesus. So the book we're studying, the book of Romans, was written shortly after the Jews returned to Rome. Our author is a lawyer. He has decided to write an outline in layman's terms what it is that the Christian faith is all about. So it becomes a kind of starter course for new Gentile converts, and it doubles as curriculum for a Jewish person who knows their history, knows their stories, meaning uh, a Jewish Christian could take this book and use it as a teaching tool, which of course makes it a great book for us to study. So why do I mention all of this? Well, because I seriously doubt that the times have changed. You know, even though the outside world has heard of Jesus and they know that Christians and and churches exist, (laughs) there is still a lot of bad information out there and they could also benefit from a book like this written for them. I would even offer that a person not raised in the church would be just as lost as a Roman citizen reading this book. So the very beginning of Romans 6 says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So Paul is answering a question, okay? A question that was popular at his time. And in chapter 6, he begins with talking about sin and death. Now, what does Paul mean by dying to sin? Does that mean that we are previously alive to sin? And, and, and what does death and life have to do with sin? This topic is one of those things that perhaps for a Jew would remind them of the story in Genesis, but for a Roman Gentile might need some explaining. At the very beginning of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, it says, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now, the word for breath there in the Hebrew is the word neshamah, and it can mean spirit. In other words, the book of Genesis says that people were created, and then God imparted part of himself into us. So when God made us, he breathed into us. No other creature, no other animal do we see this with. This means that men and women, we are made in the image of God, but we are also given life through God's divine spirit, which makes us different. 
because God's spirit is in us. So when someone says to you, I don't know if I'm religious or not, but I think I'm spiritual, you can nod and agree and say, yes, we are all spiritual. Every human being alive is spiritual. What else? Well, the Bible also says the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. That's way too much information, <laughs> right? Why tell us this? Did you ever wonder why this was an important part of the story? And to be honest, it's one of the first things we remember about Adam and Eve. If I said, tell me something about Adam and Eve, the answer, they were naked, would be in your top three answers. I, I can't even find decent pictures of them in classical art that's appropriate to show you in church. And, and I think we all know the next part of the story. A snake comes along, tempts them with fruit to eat, fruit that God specifically said not to eat. And the very next verse says, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. First, they were naked, and the Bible says they had no shame. Then they realized they are naked, they feel shame, and they cover themselves. Verse 7 says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? So here we see they are so ashamed of their nakedness that they immediately hide from God and they try to cover themselves. Why are they hiding from God? Because they feel shame. Shame not because they are naked, but because they have sinned. See, this is the child hiding from their parents, knowing that a confrontation is coming, perhaps even a punishment is coming. What punishment? Eve knows what punishment. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. That was, in fact, a lie. Because they did die. They died spiritually the moment they ate the fruit. And the Bible says their eyes were opened. That's the Bible's way of saying, from that moment on, Everything for them changed. Adam and Eve no longer saw the world the way they first did when they were created. Now their eyes were focused on earthly things instead of heavenly things. And God banishes them from the garden. Verse 22 says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Why does God banish them? Because now they've been exposed to evil. And to cut their life short, God banishes them from the tree of life, dooming them one day to a physical death. This is the starting point of Romans chapter 6. That since creation, all people, are born into a broken condition called sin. Psalm 51 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That is the starting point. Isaiah 64, We have all become like the one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Starting point. Whereas once our spiritual grandparents had a close relationship with God, they felt no shame, and now, because of sin, we are born into shame. We are all unclean at birth. The Bible says we are all mortal now, all polluted now. And Paul goes on. Paul says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, 
we too might walk in the newness of life. So Paul makes the argument. We are all born sinners. So then to have a relationship with God and to get back to the garden, that person of shame needs to die in order that we can be reborn. And Paul uses Jesus as an example. Just as Jesus died and came back to life, he says, we undergo the waters of baptism. We die to our old self and we are raised to a newness of life. In two verses, in just two verses, Paul gives us the symbolism and the theology of baptism. Water is often a symbol for chaos, for disorder. So going under the water is to symbolically go underground. In other words, to die and to come back up out of the water is to symbolically be a new person, raised to life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, I'm sure many of us have been baptized, and it was a wonderful experience. But did you ever ask yourself, am I really a new person? I mean, we felt different when it happened, but did it stick? Okay. This one might be a little harder to follow, but we'll try. Because I think for some of us, even though we are a Christian, have been baptized, we don't feel like we've been set free from sin. I mean, baptism's not magic, and I still sin, and I still feel shame when I sin. So what does Paul mean that we have been set free from sin? Well, I think before you were a Christian, sin was a difficult concept to understand. You, you might have understood right and wrong, and I don't know that you would have understood why there was a right and wrong, or, or what you could do about it. Obviously, we all sinned long before we were ever aware of it. Nobody had to teach us how to lie. No one had to teach us how to cheat. No one had to teach us how to steal. The Bible says we're born that way. Okay, so yes, when an atheist or an agnostic is arguing with you about sin and saying, well, how can, how can it be wrong? Or how can I be wrong? I was born this way. We can agree with them and say, yes, we are. We are, we are born into sin. It, it, it is our default setting. But once you are aware of it, then you are no longer a slave to it. What do I mean? I mean, once you are aware of your sin, you don't have to choose it. And you may even begin to learn how to avoid it. For instance, if before you were a Christian, maybe you had an anger issue, maybe you always flew off the handle and yelled at everyone around you. But now that you've been walking with Christ, you are now more aware of that condition, more aware of your sin. And now when you feel that urge to get angry, the spirit speaks to you and you begin to have a greater sense of self-control. Or maybe it was an addiction, you know, and before it didn't matter to you. You didn't see anything wrong with it. But as you walk with Jesus, you begin to recognize temptation when it comes around and you are able to now resist it more and more. This is what Paul means. Before, you were a slave to sin. But now that you've been set free, you have a choice. Paul says in verse 11, So, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought forth from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. So Paul says, if you can turn your back on sin, and you can recognize it when you see it, you can recognize it when you're tempted by it, then the more you can turn away from it, 
and turn towards righteousness. Slowly, sin starts to lose its hold on you. And Paul says, you will begin to see that you are actually under grace. Now, Paul's talked a lot about grace in these chapters, and as Christians, we certainly like grace. We're very thankful for it. In many ways, grace acts like a giant eraser, and it gets rid of all of our sin, gets rid of our, you know, our wrong standing with God. We, we love grace. But remember how this chapter started. It started with a question about grace, and Paul is going to return to that question right now. He's been setting all of this up to answer the question. Verse 15, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? So Paul goes back to the question, a question that perhaps a new convert would have some difficulty understanding, and, and that is this. If we are covered by grace, right, saved by grace, then why do I need to be so concerned about sin? Why can't I just go back to being worldly, back to being sinful? Now I have nothing to worry about because I am saved by grace. Do you see? It, it's like if I said, I, I have full insurance coverage on my vehicle. I should be able to drive however I want. Why does it matter what I do? I'm forgiven, right? And Paul says, no. <laughs> you only have grace if Jesus is your master. And if Jesus is your master, then you will want to live for him. You will want to choose righteousness. Albert Einstein said, if people are good only because they fear punishment and hope for reward, then we are a sorry lot indeed. And it's the same here. Sin and righteousness cannot live side by side. Just as Adam and Eve, they are banished from the Garden of Eden. When we are under sin, we are not righteous. Why? Why? Because of one of the most famous verses in all of the Bible, found right here in chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why can't sin and righteousness exist side by side? Same reason life and death cannot exist side by side. That's why Paul gives us the answer. You need to die to sin and to shame and to the old way of life so that Jesus can raise you to new life. How? He tells us by being a slave to righteousness. Well, we don't like that word. Slave, right? We don't like that word. In our culture today, uh, being a servant is really looked down upon. For one thing, the word slave is interpreted through the lens of our nation's past. Today, it's almost impossible for us to hear the word slave without thinking of how the world has dealt with slavery. Plus, I don't know if you've noticed, but we kind of all have a problem with the word obedience. We have generations of Americans who all argue, nobody's going to tell me what to do. So children don't obey their parents, students don't listen to their teachers, people don't have any respect for police officers or government. And the whole while that that's going on, we're also complaining about crime and mental health and immorality. And we're pointing fingers and we're casting blame and trying to find solutions. Trying to find solutions that a Jewish lawyer figured out 1900 years ago. Serve sin and die, serve righteousness and live. Paul says the problem stems from who your master is. It stems from who you obey. Is it sin and lawlessness or is it righteousness? Verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, who are once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Sin leads to death, obedience leads to righteousness. And, and here's the crucial difference when we talk about the world, when, when we talk about that word, slave. Slaves to sin 
are just like the slaves of our nation's history. Because slaves don't have choices. When we are born to sin, we are born into a condition that we did not choose. And for many, they're not even aware of. They could not tell you why they do what they do. And they cannot tell you why there is a moral right or a moral wrong. And Paul says, you have a choice. You can serve righteousness instead. And in truth, the word here in the Greek is closer to what you and I would call a servant than a slave. Because a servant is somebody who chooses for themselves what to serve. A servant is a willful actor who places themselves in submission to the other. Slaves obey because they fear punishment. Servants obey because they know and they trust their master. It's your choice. And Paul emphatically points out, there's no third option. You will either be a slave to one or a slave to the other. And I know a lot of Christians, you know, they try to have one foot in both worlds and they want to be Christian, but they don't want to be too Christian. Jesus addresses that in Matthew 6. He says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else be loyal to the one and despise the other. So what will it be? And if there was ever any question about what Jesus did or how Jesus lived, we can look at how he modeled his life. Mark 10 says, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So I want to give you just a, a small handful of truths about service. And the first is God saved you to serve. God has saved us to serve. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Did you know the reason that you don't just shoot up to heaven? The moment that you are saved is because the one thing we cannot do in heaven is serve. And we all get to serve God differently. The God that saves us is the same God that has saved all. And the good works that the, uh, are talked about here in Ephesians talks about the works that serve people. All those people. And God has given us purpose in doing good works to serve them. Which means if God has saved us to serve, then when we serve, we find purpose. We find fulfillment. When we serve, we feel like we are doing what we were born to do. We feel alive because we have been saved to serve. And I know it sounds overwhelming, but the good news is that God even has gifted us to serve. First Peter 4 says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Not only has God given me purpose in being a servant, but then he enables me to serve by giving me gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, it tells us that God has given us all different gifts to make one body. And so we can be more effective when we serve. That means each of our gifts are enhanced when we serve alongside the other, when we use our gifts. That's, that's even more good news. Because not only does God equip us to serve, but we are stronger and more effective when we serve together. This is what we should be doing together, here, at a church, serving alongside each other, using our gifts, so that ultimately God is glorified when we serve. That should be the ultimate purpose, right? To bring glory to God when we serve we are being more Christ-like because Christ served. Listen, God has given you a purpose in serving and he has gifted you to serve. And when you do those things, you glorify God and then God blesses us in return. God blesses us when we serve. Colossians 3 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does. Are you experiencing that blessing? Of 
of serving, serving others? Are you, are you experiencing a greater fulfilled life? This is Paul's argument. When you serve sin, you are a slave to sin. When you live for self, when you live for the world, that is all inward. Make no mistake, all right? The lie that was told in the Garden of Eden was, was life will be great when you can do whatever you want. I will be fulfilled if I concern myself with only the things that I want. And certainly, that is the lie that is still being told to the world. Don't believe the lie. Sin leads to death, not life. Sin leads to shame. Banishment, not fulfillment. Choose righteousness. Life will be rewarding and fulfilling as you serve others as Christ served others. I want you to think about that for the remainder of this year. As we head into a new year, who does Walden Church need to reach? Who do we need to serve? What ministries should we begin? Is your gift being utilized? How can you serve with the gifts that God has given you? How can we preach a message of righteousness to even more people? I'll give you one opportunity. I'll give you one opportunity right now. You can begin to start thinking about it. Next year, our church has been asked to lead Bible club at the school next door. And it's only for one day a week. It's only an hour long. And it is probably only eight weeks in length. And the best news is, you don't even have to be a teacher. We just need you to help us and assist us in loving those kids and to start showing them Jesus. We need 10 volunteers to make it run, to make it work. Otherwise, we're gonna to have to tell the school that we can't do it. In the past, much larger churches than us have been doing this. And this is the first time we've been asked and we really want to do this. Miss Teresa is super excited. She has lots of great ideas, but we need your help. We need your gifts. Whether it's Sunday school, Stephen's ministry, grief share, benevolence, visiting the homebound, singing in the choir, or any brand new thing that we haven't thought of yet, we need your gifts for his glory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this body of Christ. We thank you for your church how you bring us all together from diverse backgrounds and you equip each one of us to serve. May we each find a place to serve you in the body of Christ. May we serve wholeheartedly. May we serve in love and grace. May it be our passion to pursue righteousness, to serve righteousness and to lead others away from sin, from shame, from death. We thank you for each blessing. Amen. Hey, we want to thank you for coming out and worshiping with us today. Of course, we want to remind you that we have two services every single Sunday. We have a service at 930, which would probably be more of our traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing hymns from the hymnal. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. We're going to have responsive readings. We're going to take communion. It's going to be exactly like the church that you remember growing up. At 11 o'clock, we have a more contemporary service. We have a worship team. Come casual, come however you feel uh, best. <laughs> and of course, we have a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. And we would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.